Okay, well, I'm confident more people will keep coming in, but uh, it's 2.01 here in the central time zone, so might as well get started. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to a special Friday the 13th edition of Vamos. Um, and uh, appropriately enough, uh, you know, one of the nice things about Vamos, of course, is that it's kind of allowed us to host these seminars from people all across the world. And in this case, that includes uh, me hosting Mark giving a seminar just about 100 feet uh, down the hall from me in the same place. Uh, we could have even done this with sitting next to each other, Mark, if we, want, if we wanted to. But, um, but no, I think this is a better way to do it. So um, it's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce Mark Safman. Um, so Mark did uh, his undergraduate at Caltech and then actually took um, a bit of a break from academia and went into industry. Uh, he was a staff, staff scientist and then optical engineer for something like eight years or so, uh, but then um, decided to rejoin us in academia and uh, did his PhD at um, UC, Bol uh, in UC Boulder slash Jilla uh, with Dana Anderson uh, and finished it in 1994. He was then a senior scientist at uh, National Lab in Denmark before starting here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1999. Um, and subsequently, since then, he's kind of come full circle because he's now also back in industry uh, and is both a professor here, but also chief scientist for quantum information at Cold Quanta, where he works on building quantum computers for industry. Um, Mark has achieved, uh, you know, a number of very important uh, results, uh, in influential and high profile results, the most uh, kind of prominent of which is probably the first demonstrations of um, Rydberg blockade between single atoms and the first two qubit gate with neutral atoms, which has really now uh, spawned an entire you know, uh, worldwide effort to do neutral atom quantum computing. So Mark really was into you know, neutral atom quantum computing before it was cool. Um, and as a result, he's, he's received a number of uh, awards and recognitions, including um, he's a fellow at the APS and the Optical Society of America. He was uh, a recipient of the Vilas Associate Award. He was a Sloan fellow. Um, and he was also the 2019 Wharf Innovation uh, Award, received the 2019 Wharf Innovation Award here for uh, some patents related to neutral atom quantum computing. So uh, we're really looking forward to your talk, talk, Mark, and please take it away. Thanks for the kind introduction, Shimon. <clears throat> Happy to be here for those of you online and maybe for those who might uh, view this on, on YouTube later. And uh, happy to take any questions or discussion points as I go along. And that I think it doesn't matter if it uh, takes up some of the time. I think it's, it's really useful to, to have a two-way discussion on these things. So I'd like to tell you today about some things we're working on using atom arrays primarily for computation, which as Shimon said, uh, I've been working on for a long time uh, here in Wisconsin, but also some, some newer projects we're working on, uh, one related to networking of these atom arrays and another actually together with Shimon about a new uh, idea for, for sensing time that is an atomic clock. And uh, this is work down at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, for full disclosure, I also uh, work very closely with the Cold Quanta company who are working to commercialize uh, this approach to um, quantum computing. So <clears throat> atom arrays have been around for a long time and uh, have been an important part of the atomic physics toolbox for, for many years. And I just picked out a couple examples here. There are many more examples, of course. And you know, if you look back uh, 15, 20 years ago, we saw some of the very first examples of um, on-demand entanglement generation between um, a cold atoms and uh, you know, single atoms uh, done in optical arrays, uh, done with uh, collisional or motional control of the atoms, state-dependent motional control. This is uh, this uh, very well-known work from, from Hensch and Block from 2003. Uh, the first optical lattice clock uh, was a couple years later. This picture is a little bit misleading because the experiment they did was actually in a 1D lattice uh, where you had more than one atom at, in each of the um, optical traps, but it was aspirational at the time, I believe, for getting to where you have single atoms in each of the optical traps. And that's indeed a uh, architecture that's been implemented since. This is the work from Katori's group in 2005, and also another uh, controlled entanglement experiment a couple years later from Bill Phillips and, and Trey Porto um, at NIST at University of Maryland. So, you know, there's been lots and lots of work uh, using atom arrays and um, 
some of the really recent uh, developments in the field are very nicely reviewed uh, in this article by Adam Kaufman and Ken Quinn Nee that just came out last year uh, in Nature Physics. So <clears throat> there's a lot of different things one can do with uh, arrays of atoms and optical lattices. And what I want to do today is, is talk about three topics. And I'm going to start talking about the work uh, we've been doing on quantum computing in 2D arrays of trapped single atoms. And uh, this is work that just appeared in print uh, last month. Uh, and then I'll uh, tell you a bit about some efforts that are underway to uh, connect uh, multiple examples of this type of processor by uh, using remote entanglement over a quantum network. And then talk about some, some new uh, work we're just getting started on to use, uh, in this case, 3D arrays of trapped single atoms uh, for making uh, a new kind of atomic uh, array clock or optical lattice clock. And these projects are at different stages of development. I mean, the quantum computer is operational and I'll tell you about uh, what we've been doing and what we just published, but also share some um, unpublished data about some of the new directions we've been going in in the last few months uh, in the lab here. Uh, the quantum network is under construction and I'll just relatively briefly uh, tell you about what we're building there and how we're approaching this. And this uh, atomic clock, although we're looking at some aspects of it already, it's really still in the design phase. And I'm not sure I'll have enough time to get to it, but time permitting, I'll tell you a little bit about what, what's uh, going on there. So jumping into the quantum computing, you know, I think people know that there's, there's a handful of approaches that are being very actively uh, developed. Uh, towards uh, useful quantum computing. And uh, you can sort of divide the most popular approaches into a couple categories. There's the atomic qubits, be they uh, uh, trapped ions or neutral atoms. And then there's engineered qubits, superconductors and quantum dots. I'd say all of these approaches have um, uh, selling points and also challenges and you know, none of these, uh, uh, the way I like to put it sometimes is that no one uh, no matter how much money they have, actually uh, has a blueprint for how to build a large-scale fault-tolerant quantum computer today. So there's there's still lots of uh, creative work and R&D that needs to be done to realize the potential of this field. And then in my mind, I put optical qubits over to the side, be they single photon optical or uh, squeeze coherent state uh, approaches to, to optical quantum computing. Some people think optical is the only way to build a big quantum computer. Some people think it's the last way that will ever work. Uh, I don't wanna get into that debate right here, but um, suffice it to say, there are, there's a handful of approaches that are being looked at and, and we're focused on neutral atoms, which is what I'm gonna talk about now. If you dig down a level deeper and ask, you know, what are some of the options that one can um, choose in terms of uh, leveraging the capabilities of neutral atom arrays for information processing, you, could, you might divide the uh, field into uh, an analog and a digital type approach. And analog simulators have been uh, demonstrated by, by a number of groups, uh, more groups than have demonstrated uh, gate model machines uh, with neutral atoms. And you know, some really beautiful experiments in the last couple of years, and in particular, the work from, from the Harvard group and the uh, Paris group, have now demonstrated analog simulation with the arrays of 200 or more uh, neutral atoms with Riberg interactions. Uh, the analog approach has um, simplified control compared to uh, digital uh, gate model. It's not universal, it's partially programmable. There's many interesting things and problems that can be uh, studied uh, with these analog uh, systems. Uh, both you know, studies of really physics motivated problems, um, you know, many body interacting spin models, but also problems related to numerical optimization of, of graph problems. Uh, but they're, they're not universal, they're partially programmable. And the question of error correction as one scales up to larger systems and, and deeper computations, you know, remains, I would say, open. It's not uh, entirely clear to what extent error correction is gonna be possible with an analog approach. On the other hand, the digital gate model circuit, um, one has full quantum state control and if, and it's universal because any um, unitary we may wish to implement can be decomposed into a series of one and two qubit gate operations and this type of circuit. So in principle, 
uh, this is a universal type machine that can implement any, any problem describable by, by a Hamiltonian. So they're, they're universally programmable. And although error correction remains extremely challenging and is not yet working today in, in, a, in a useful way, there's a well um, studied and well defined path in principle towards achieving uh, error correction with these uh, digital type machines. And, and the digital approach is what my group has, has focused on. So what underlies the capabilities of these atom arrays for information processing is not just the ability to prepare quantum states of single atoms and uh, control those quantum states, put them anywhere on the block sphere, but also to uh, perform two qubit and multi qubit interactions to prepare entanglements. And atoms are very attractive quantum systems for doing this uh, because we have this capability of turning on and off very strong interactions. If we encode quantum state information in the hyperfine states, for example, of an alkali atom, these states have very long coherence. And if we put them relatively close to each other, for example, a few microns apart in an optical array, they interact extremely weakly, about a millihertz interaction rate. So that's a great quantum memory. But if we want to do computation, we do need interactions. And we achieve those interactions by shining laser pulses at the atoms, going up to highly excited Rydberg states where the electron lives in a uh, spatially extended orbital and turning on interactions that are stronger by up to 12 orders of magnitude. And it's really this ability in this uh, single atom system with Rydberg interactions to the ability to turn the interaction coherently on and off with this enormous contrast ratio that, that's an enabling for, for many quantum information applications. And the, the key aspect of the Rydberg interaction that translates into entanglement generation is the Rydberg blockade, that if one, if one has one Rydberg excited atom, one cannot um, excite a second atom that's too close by because of the um, interaction shifting the energy levels and thereby blocking the excitation of a second atom. And there's, there's many different states that can be used for this. Any of these states up here can be referred to as Rydberg states. Uh, perhaps uh, I'm being a little bit repetitive, but just to look at it once more from a slightly different angle, the, the advantage here of an atomic system is that we're able to satisfy these conflicting requirements of isolation of the quantum system, yet also control of the quantum system in a single platform. So we work with laser cooled atoms trapped by light in vacuum. This is a superb quantum memory that has long coherence and is isolated from the environment. Uh, we can selectively control individual atoms using focused laser pulses and uh, go up to these Rydberg states where we get these very strong interactions and in principle uh, prepare entanglement in uh, tens of nanoseconds. Uh, the fastest Rydberg gates that have been demonstrated so far are around half a microsecond or at some hundreds of nanoseconds, but uh, I believe there's a path forwards towards getting even below 100 nanoseconds into the tens of nanoseconds regime. And just one more plot on the, the Rydberg interactions. It's interesting to look at exactly how strong these interactions are as a function of the two atom separation and the states we're considering. In the ground state, the interactions are very weak, dominated by magnetostatic dipole dipole. As we go up to Rydberg levels with higher and higher principal quantum number, the interactions get stronger and stronger. And um, just to sort of put a marker in the ground here, the experiment, the circuit experiments I'll tell you about in a few minutes, uh, these were done with the 75S Rydberg state at two atom separations of nine microns. And so that gave us um, interaction strengths of about three uh, megahertz. If we were to push the principal quantum number up a bit higher, say up to the 100S state, we could get that same interaction strength at about 20 micron separation. And if you think about an array of atoms with say two and a half micron spacing, you're talking about the ability to to fully connect uh, groups of up to 60 qubits. So there, there's a great potential here for having really quite high connectivity at scale in these atom arrays. And that's something that in general is very difficult to achieve in engineered quantum systems. 
Okay, so with that introduction, you know, which atoms should we choose? Well, there's a whole bunch of atoms in the periodic table that have been uh, laser cooled and, and trapped. And if we, we think about work with um, single atom arrays for quantum information, uh, really the uh, primary uh, choices have been the heavy alkalis, rubidium and cesium, that have uh, good hyperfine separations in the ground state and also good hyperfine separations in the first excited states, which is important for cycling and, and optical pumping for state preparation. Uh, a lot of progress in the last couple of years on moving over to the alkaline earth atom, strontium and ytterbium, which provides some new opportunities for, for quantum computing. And so let's take a little bit closer look at that. When we talk about qubit encoding in a heavy alkali, be it cesium or rubidium, uh, generally people are using the M equals zero clock states to reduce magnetic sensitivity, and then using the first couple levels for uh, cooling and, and state preparation and measurements. And there's a number of groups around the world working uh, with alkali atoms for this application. And then there's been really exciting progress with, with strontium ytterbium in the last couple of years, which um, have a more complex structure, but also provide some more opportunities. You have the, the strong Doppler transition for your first stage cooling, and then you can do uh, get the atoms very cold with that narrow line second stage cooling, going to the triplet P1. And there's multiple options for qubit encoding. One could use um, round nuclear spin states and isotopes that have a nuclear spin. Uh, you could encode in the uh, nuclear spin states at the metastable electronic level, as in particular is being proposed for um, ytterbium by Jeff Thompson and Shimon and their collaborators. So one puts the qubit uh, up here and the triplet P0 using the I one half isotope of ytterbium. And one can also have a ground to metastable optical frequency qubit. So great progress also in these atoms. Um, you know, at a, at a number of places, and I believe there's more experiments being built. Uh, in my mind, the jury's out as to whether or not we'll see alkali atoms or alkaline earth atoms ultimately be preferable for this application. There, there's plenty of um, research to be done on all of these species uh, going to the future. So I wanna tell you about some, some recent progress we've made in developing and uh, demonstrating quantum circuits uh, with these neutral atom qubits. And um, just last month, there were two papers published in Nature Back to Back from uh, Misha Lukin's group at Harvard with his uh, collaborators at MIT also, and our work, which was a collaboration between the university, Cold Quanta, and the River Lane Company. And it's interesting to note that these two experiments used um, very complementary methods of, of implementing the dynamically reconfigurable connectivity that one needs for, for circuit operations. In the Harvard work, uh, the idea was to use relatively large but stationary laser beams, which could address multiple atoms and multiple atom pairs at one time and thereby create uh, multiple entangled pairs in one shot. And then reconfigurability and circuits circuit definition was provided by moving the atoms. So using tweezers to move the atoms around between different operation zones. In our work, we kept the atoms stationary and moved the laser beams around. So we, we focus our laser beams down to uh, very small uh, focal spots of just a few microns, address individual atoms with uh, laser pulses, and then uh, point the laser beams to different sites. And on the one hand, we can move laser beams much faster than you can move atoms if you want to also keep the atoms cold and not heat them up too much. On the other hand, um, it seems uh, convenient to move the atoms further and have a higher degree of um, adjustable connectivity than we can today achieve by moving the laser beams around. And, you know, it's likely ultimately that some combination of these techniques can be very powerful. But let me, let me tell you now in more detail about how we built this system and what we did with it. So the, the atom we're using is uh, cesium and tongue in cheek, I like to call that an industry standard qubit given that the uh, hyperfine transition, clock transition of cesium is the, the current international definition of the second. And the, the states we use are the three comma zero, four comma zero clock states. 
These are themselves entangled superpositions of nuclear and electronic spin projections, but not the type of entanglement that's useful for quantum information. Uh, these states have excellent coherence properties in free space, you know, lifetimes that are decades long. When optically trapped, there's some perturbation of the levels. Uh, coherence times of um, 10 seconds have been demonstrated. And with appropriate engineering of the trap uh, conditions, it seems possible to reach minute scale coherence, although that's not yet been demonstrated in the lab. So the operational sequence involves uh, laser cooling of the atoms, uh, loading them into arrays of traps. Uh, we follow that by some additional second stage cooling and then using rearrangement techniques to, to fill a certain subset of the uh, trap sites for use as a qubit register. So I'm not gonna go through all of these steps. Many of them are, are quite standard, but just say a little bit about the optical trapping techniques we're using. Uh, broadly speaking, there's two types of optical traps. There's uh, red traps where uh, the light provides an attractive potential and atoms are localized at uh, local maxima of the intensity. Uh, that's great for moving atoms around, uh, filling the register. Uh, in our work for the actual computation, we use blue traps, which provide a repulsive potential and atoms are confined at local minima of the optical intensity. This has the nice feature that it uh, reduces the light scattering and light shifts as seen by the atoms. And it's also possible to um, uh, design the uh, size of the trapping potential to provide magic trapping between ground states and ripper states of the alkali atoms. And, uh, there's some old theory work here that describes uh, those types of uh, design exercises. We've uh, over the years looked at different ways of uh, developing arrays of blue detuned traps, starting with a single uh, bottle beam created by, by crossing two uh, Laguerre-Gauss vortex beams. We made arrays of those. Uh, we used something called a Gaussian beam array a few years ago, which were weakly overlapped uh, blue detuned Gaussian beams with atoms trapped at the minima between them. Uh, we are most recently uh, using something we call a line array, which is a grid of blue detuned lines of light. The atoms are trapped in these cages in between the lines. And if you think about diffractive propagation out of the plane, that diffraction fills in uh, the line spread and one achieves a 2D array of three-dimensional dark traps. Um, I'll tell you in a few minutes about yet another way of making these arrays of blue detune traps that we're, we're currently uh, transitioning to. But we've been scaling this up over the years up to several hundreds of traps and this dynamic line array, which we currently use can be reconfigured very rapidly using um, just a signal generator controlled um, acousto-optic deflectors. Uh, and then the, ne the next step in preparing the register is atom rearrangement. If we want to load single atoms into optical traps, this is out of the box, if you will, a um, stochastic process where we get about half of the sites, sometimes more than half, but order half the sites with an atom in and other sites empty. And the array can then be deterministically uh, filled using atom rearrangement. And this was really a, a very important step forward in the field. It was introduced uh, five, six years ago now by groups in Korea at Paris and, and the Lucan group at Harvard. And it's since become one of the standard uh, toolboxes uh, for working with atom arrays. I think the most beautiful demonstration of this is this atomic uh, Eiffel Tower from Antoine Broazis group. That's, that's really cool. And uh, we also use this now in our experiment with the blue detune trap array and can, for example, spell out physics here using um, single cesium atoms. So those are the um, most of the steps in the qubit register preparation. And then the calculation cycle involves preparing the quantum state, uh, implementing a quantum circuit, which is some sequence of gates and measuring the results. So our experimental... So Mark, sorry. So uh, Bill, Bill Phillips has a question that um, is about um, the line traps. So he was asking, um, could you say something about the limitations related to the Raleigh range of the uh, line traps? Sure. So, so these traps are intrinsically um, 
asymmetrical and that the transverse confinement in the plane for a few micron spacing of the lines is much tighter than the axial confinement. So they have a, an aspect ratio of three, four to one. Um, but they, they do fill in as, as three-dimensional trapping potentials. One limitation of these line traps, if you're keen on scaling to large numbers, is that these lines get very long and narrow. And so it becomes increasingly challenging to actually prepare them and um, image them onto the atoms using optics. And so um, that's one of the reasons why we've, we're now moving over to a different approach to, to making these trap arrays. So the, the core of the experimental geometry is a vacuum cell. This is a cold quanta produced cell, which has electrodes inside for controlling the local field environment. Uh, we do atom imaging from both sides with high NA lenses and route those images over to different regions on a EMCCD camera. And then we have um, the line array grid uh, projected in. We have a 2D deflectors for the atom rearrangement. And then we have also 2D deflectors for the Rydberg excitation uh, beams and beams also that go into local phase gates and shown schematically here. And uh, this has now been um, laid out in CAD and uh, really um, engineered by engineering team at Cold Quanta. And that's been part of our progress in the last few years is working with professional engineers on the um, optical, optomechanical side of things. Uh, for qubit control, we're using, I would say, too many lasers. And we're, I think, about to add yet another color. But it's currently six different colors of laser light and something like 13 laser systems. And uh, you know, the uh, uptime between events where one of those lasers gets unhappy is uh, shorter than we would like. But, but that's life. I'll just move on then. And our gate set involves the following components. We have global rotations of the qubits uh, using microwaves about any um, axis in the XY plane of the block sphere. Uh, we can perform uh, single side phase gates with a focus laser beam. And combining that focus beam with the microwaves, we can perform single side uh, XY type gates. And then we use the river blockade for a controlled phase gate, which we combine with local rotations to make a CNOT gate. Uh, native multi-qubit gates are also possible. Uh, there's a very nice demonstration of the Toffoli gate from, from the Lucan group a couple of years ago. So here's an example of some old data just showing how straightforward it is to perform global rotations with microwaves. So this was about a 10 kilohertz uh, Rabi rate with resonant microwaves driving the clock transition. Uh, using randomized benchmarking, we had average fidelities uh, just shy of three nines. Uh, more recently, we've uh, put a larger amplifier in place. So we've boosted the microwave frequencies up higher and, and repeated the randomized benchmarking uh, characterization of the gates. Uh, we now see, this is now a 49 site array for this work. We see spam errors of about 3% per site. And the average um, gate fidelity for the Clifford set is now just shy of four nines. And that's really uh, all about getting the atoms a bit colder, uh, better coherence time, and, and driving faster with the microwaves. And this is absolutely not a limitation. I think five, five nines and better are certainly within reach. Uh, the single qubit gates. Uh, RZ gates can be obtained with a focused stark shifting laser beam. So we detune from uh, one of the first excited states and the detuning of the two qubit states is different, which gives us a uh, stark shift depending on the uh, length and time of the uh, laser pulse. And if we combine that with global microwave rotations, we can get site selected uh, rotations on single atom. So if one does a global rotation of minus pi by two, plus five by two, uh, that cancels out. That's done with microwaves. And if we insert on a specific site or sites, a local phase shift, we can convert that into a local rotation on specific sites. This is a method that was introduced by uh, Dave Weiss's group. And we, we've copied that idea for our uh, machine. 
So here's a characterization of single uh, qubit uh, gate operations. Uh, here, just using six sites in the array. Uh, the spam on those six sites was about two and a half percent on average, and the fidelity of the gates was um, 0.993, so lower than just the global microwaves because there's some additional dephasing error from from the focused laser beams and alignment of those laser beams to individual sites. And then the all important two qubit gates. So this slide shows some examples of a two qubit entangling gate preparing bell states done in two different limits, in a strong blockade limit and a weak blockade limit. Uh, here we're using the 75S state and we use the protocol uh, introduced by the Harvard group with parameters adjusted for either strong blockade or weak blockade. So in this example on the left here, uh, we used a somewhat larger laser beam, about um, seven and a half micron waste, which simultaneously illuminated two atoms spaced three microns apart. And for this separation and the Rydberg state we used, the interaction is about a gigahertz. The laser ground Rydberg Rabi frequency was uh, just about two megahertz. So this is a very strong blockade limit. And uh, we obtained a fidelity accounting for the populations and the parity oscillation amplitude of about 0.94. Uh, with the same Rydberg state, but much more widely spaced, so going to nine microns, and then uh, smaller beams, each of three micron waste individually uh, targeting on the different sites, uh, we were able to get a very similar uh, fidelity. In fact, perhaps surprisingly, uh, about a percent higher fidelity, even though we're in this uh, really a weak blockade limit. The, Interaction was three megahertz, the Robbie rate was two megahertz. So this is not a blockade gate. This is something in between uh, partial blockade and also interaction of two Rydberg excited atoms. And so it's, it's very, um, let me say, convenient that one can adjust parameters to work both at small separ optimized for small separation and large separations uh, in one system. And this is the um, configuration that we use for, for circuit. Uh, demonstrations. So what have we done in terms of circuits? Uh, we started with demonstration of using the standard circuit to prepare a multi-particle GHC state, a maximally entangled state, and standard circuit for that is to put one of the qubits in a superposition uh, state with a Hadamard gate and then perform a string of C knots uh, between pairs of qubits to prepare this maximally entangled state. And so we did that uh, using up to six sites shown here. The blue line showed the connections uh, across which we implemented the CNOT gates. And the actual circuit shown here, which doesn't look quite the same as what's on the previous slide, but this has been um, sort of hand tailored, optimized at the compilation stage to uh, make the circuit as short as possible. Uh, using the, the gate set that we have available. So it's a combination of um, global microwave pulses, um, CZ operations, and a number of single qubit uh, phase gates or S gates acting on the qubits. And here you see the parity oscillations going from a two atom bell state up to a, a six atom GHC state. Uh, this is the extracted fidelities. Uh, for the raw data and then a small correction accounting for spam errors. And uh, we passed the threshold between entanglement and uh, separable states at, at six states. Uh, the corrected data could be pushed out further to scale this to larger numbers of atoms, larger GHC states uh, will require some additional improvement in our gate fidelities. And we also looked at the decoherence time of these states and we see a one over n scaling. Uh, this uh, one here just refers to the T2 star of a single qubit in the clock states, which uh, for this data set was about three and a half milliseconds, and then uh, close to a one over n scaling as we increase the size of the GHC state. So that was a, a first test we did. Uh, we then looked at the phase estimation algorithm, which is one of the most important quantum algorithms uh, useful for quantum chemistry and also plays a central role in Shor's factoring algorithm. And the phase estimation algorithm 
extracts the phase of some unitary operator. The, the phase uh, produced by that operator on a quantum state is mapped onto a register of qubits, which uh, encode the phase information. And then performing a quantum Fourier transform uh, converts that into a uh, population distribution, which is peaked at the frequency uh, telling you uh, what, what the uh, phase of the operator is. So standard uh, quantum circuit for doing that. Uh, we did a first test of that by just checking with a two qubit register and one qubit for the operator, so a three qubit circuit, if we could measure the uh, phases uniformly distributed between zero and two pi. And so here you see uh, the circuit for that. Most of this circuit, this part here is the phase extraction. And then the last two pieces here are the Fourier transform. And we did that for the identity root Z, Z, and Z to the three halves. And the, the dark blue are the experimental results. The light blue are the ideal results one would get uh, if for perfect gate operations. So we, we hit about 60 to 70% here uh, for this uh, first demonstration. And then we, we went ahead and tried something a little bit more challenging and looked at a problem motivated by um, chemistry and looked at extracting the um, energy of the hydrogen molecule using a trotterized version of the hartree fock Hamiltonian, which um, can be written uh, in this form as just uh, constants times the Z and X operators. So again, we have the phase kickback part of the circuit and then the, the QFT, this is a much deeper circuit. Uh, I had a depth of about, uh, not about a depth of 14 CZ gates, a large number of single qubit operations. Uh, the total execution time for the circuit was about a millisecond. Uh, this was now running into our T2 star time. Uh, we were able to show that T2 uh, could be extended to close to a second using dynamical decoupling, but that was not used for the circuit. So the circuit was, was run with the circuit time, you know, about a third of the T2 star time, and that intrinsic decoherence also impacted the results obtained. And you can see those results here. Um, for this uh, problem, the, the state we started with um, gave uh, an output result that has a, uh, most of the population in, in one of the uh, phases and uh, about 20% of the population in another one. We were able to hit most of the population in the one that should be highest. But again, we're limited here by decoherence and also uh, gate fidelity. And then the last uh, circuit we looked at was the QAOA algorithm applied to the well-known max cut problem, which is a, a graph combinatorial problem where one seeks to divide a graph of uh, connected nodes into two classes in a way that maximizes the number of cuts uh, across the um, lines separating those two classes. And although this is kind of an abstract mathematical problem, it actually has a large number of applications, including to problems like unsupervised uh, pattern recognition, dividing groups of images into different classes. And you can think of QAOA as a discretized or trotterized version of adiabatic evolution, where one's alternating between a mixer Hamiltonian uh, which scrambles the states and a problem Hamiltonian, which encodes a cost function, driving the uh, quantum state to the lowest energy state, solving the, the problem of interest. And for this max cut problem, uh, the uh, relevant problem Hamiltonian is the product of Z operators on connected states minus the identity. If those uh, connected nodes are in the same state, then one gets zero here. If they're in opposite states, ZZ gives you a minus one, which drives down the energy and leads you to the desired solution. So uh, we ran this um, with multiple rounds of that mixer problem Hamiltonian steps. Uh, here's the circuit for one round where the ZZ interaction is decomposed into two C not gates and a local Z rotation. Uh, we went up to three rounds, which was the deepest circuit we attempted, this was uh, 43 single qubit gates and 18 CZ gates. Uh, here's the results for QAOA on a four node graph. 
uh, for a single uh, round of um, problem and mixer Hamiltonians. We achieved an approximation ratio. So you can think of this as how close we are to the ideal uh, max cut solution. Uh, if we had ideal gate operations, we should have got 0.77, so reasonably close. A second round through, we got a slightly improved result. Theoretically, it should be much improved. And then at three rounds, we're starting to see uh, reduced performance because the gate errors are building up beyond what we're, we're really able to support with this hardware at this time. So that's what we've done on, on circuit operations. And maybe that's a good place just to stop and, and ask if there's any questions about this part. Yeah, great. There's a, there's a number of questions. So um, Bill Phillips has a question about the GHC states you generated. So he wants to know if you were using the GHC states as clocks with higher frequency uh, and that increased with the N, the number of atoms, would you beat this uh, sort of root N scaling that you expect for clock metrology? In principle, yes. And then principle is one thing and practice is another. And you want also has to look at the decoherence that the coherence time of this GHG state is scaling as one over N, which perhaps um, you know, counteracts the, the root N, the N scaling benefit we get in the phase sensitivity. So we have not attempted something like that. Uh, we're interested in trying that in the future with a new clock idea, also involving arrays of cesium atoms, but um, possibly, but uh, we're not sure today. Great, and then, um, so uh, Jonathan was, was wondering, what are the physical limits on the gate fidelities? And, and are the current fidelities mostly limited by, by so, so, so what are the current limits and then what are the physics or fundamental limits that you anticipate? Yeah, so I have a couple slides in a bit about the gate fidelity, so let me defer answering that question. Okay, great. Uh, and then we just got a question, can you talk more about the error buildup as you increase the runs on the QAOA circuit? Sure. So um, the P equals three circuit with 18 gates, it's six gates per um, round of P. And so our gate fidelities were sort of in the low 90s, averaged over the uh, pairs of atoms uh, we're using. And so if you take, uh, so that's an error, let's call it 8%, 18 by 8% is more than 50%. So I really don't expect to get any kind of useful result out at a circuit depth of 18. It's really dominated by the two qubit error. Our single qubit errors are very low. And we're also, this was also around a millisecond um, uh, duration of the circuit. So we're also running into just decoherence times here. So, so plenty of things to improve. Um, maybe you'll answer this when you get to the, um, to the gate fidelities and things, but what is limiting T2 star specifically? T2 star is currently limited by uh, differential light shifts and the traps by atom motion. So it's really atom temperature limited. And uh, our atom temperature for these uh, experiments was about six microkelvin. We were colder than that. And then after optical pumping about six microkelvin. Okay, maybe one last question. Uh, I guess this, this might be kind of jumping the gun or putting the cart before the horse, but looking ahead to a sort of fault tolerant quantum error correction, um, I guess you probably need to generate these magic states uh, for, for to, to implement T gates. Uh, is that something that you've tried at all or looked at? We've not tried that, but let me also, I'll say a bit more about that in a few slides. Great. Okay. Then maybe that's a perfect opportunity to sure. move on. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let me skip this slide about QAOA and optimizing it. Um, so, you know, it's been a pretty steep path so far over quite a few years. I think the, the hill gets even steeper as we uh, continue to, to make progress here, but uh, it's, uh, it's a beautiful environment to be doing these things. Okay, so you know what's the outlook here? NISC era hardware certainly has potential for pick your favorite adjective, quantum advantage, benefit, usefulness, and uh, there, there's a large community of researchers exploring uh, directions for doing that. At the same time, I think uh, it's widely agreed that accessing the full spectrum of quantum computing use cases will require error correction and fault tolerance. And quantum error correction is very resource demanding. There's no doubt about that. It's, people are trying to, uh, to optimize it and reduce those resource requirements, but it is very demanding. 
And so, you know, depending on the coherence of the qubits we have available, the fidelity of the gate operations and the measurements, it's anticipated that a fault tolerant logical qubit may require 100 to 1000 physical qubits. And so a machine would say 100 logical qubits that could absolutely tackle important problems that are not uh, accessible on, on classical computing devices. This may be 10,000 or more physical qubits. And so, you know, from an experimentalist perspective, you might ask, well, what are the minimal set of requirements? What are some of the immediate things that we need to make progress on? We are going to need a lot of qubits. We are going to need high fidelity gates, even higher fidelity than we've demonstrated so far. And we're going to need mid-circuit measurements as part of error correcting code implementations. And so uh, what I want to do is, is tell you a bit about recent work, some of it up on the archive, some of it just fill in the lab, uh, starting to tackle these three issues. So more qubits. Well, we want to make larger arrays. And I mentioned some of the limits of scaling this line array up to even larger sizes. And I want to show you some, some fun optics we did lately uh, showing a very simple way uh, using a passive system without any active modulators and making very large trap arrays. And this is based on a notion of 4F filtering. If I take a plane wave and send it through a mask that's uh, transmitting in the center here, uh, I just get a um, uniform intensity uh, transmitted through that mask. If I then go into the Fourier plane and low pass filter it, and the Fourier plane, I'll have an airy pattern. And I'm going to low pass filter it to only transmit the first lobe of the airy pattern and then transform again. So this is a classical 4F filtering arrangement used in optical signal processing. What comes out uh, with that procedure turns out to be extremely close to a Gaussian beam with some very weak lobes uh, separated from, from the main center. So that creates a bright Gaussian beam. You can actually do the same thing and create a dark uh, trap. If I have a mask that is uh, transmitting but has a um, partially or fully attenuating disk here, then I'll get a um, background of light with a reduced intensity in the center. Again, I'll transform for a filter and transform again. One gets now a very close to Gaussian dark trap. You can think of this as a plane wave minus a Gaussian beam. And what's, so that's for a single trap. And if I then take an array of these traps in the Fourier plane, they all go through the mask. And then I image again, I get an array of dark traps. So here's an array of uh, 1,225 dark traps uh, produced using this fabricated component. And we've gone ahead and trapped cesium atoms uh, in this array. So here's a single shot of loading and an averaged image. We've not yet uh, done the rearrangement here, but that should be very straightforward. And we're able to trap at um, 1,225 sites, indeed using a low cost multimode laser. And we believe this technique can be scaled to many thousands of, of trapping sites. Uh, details about the approach are in this reprint. So that's one thing we're looking at. What about the gate fidelity, which is really important for pushing these systems along? Well, there, there's been great progress in the last couple of years. Uh, four groups have now demonstrated uh, Rydberg-mediated entanglement uh, close to around 98%. Um, our very latest results, which are unpublished, uh, push the fidelity up to 98%. Uh, the Harvard result from a couple of years ago got to 97. The numbers in parentheses are spam corrected. Uh, there's a very nice result out of Wuhan where they got to 98%. And um, the Endris group uh, achieved 99% uh, using strontium, uh, not a full gate and not long-lived qubits. These are ground ripper qubits, but, but very high entanglement. Um, the current limitations are still technical and improved fidelity is going to rely on colder atoms, uh, beam shaping if one uses small beams, <clears throat> excuse me, low noise lasers and higher power to reduce intermediate state photon scattering when one uses uh, two photon excitation. So here's the data from our uh, best result to date in the lab, and this shows a spam corrected fidelity uh, just north of 98%. These are the Bell populations. This is the uh, parity amplitude. What got us here relative to 
a few percent lower for the uh, circuit results was really just tighter confinement, going to some more tightly confining traps, reducing the motion of the atoms under the um, envelope of the control laser beams. Um, so technical is part of it. And there's also the question of developing even better protocols. And here's an example of what I think is perhaps a, the, a maximally simple CZ gate protocol, which acts symmetrically in both atoms. This is work done with uh, a scientist in my group, Trent Graham and Francis Robichaud. This is, and actually was independently, the same protocol was independently developed by group in Wuhan. And this involves a single uh, pulse applied to both atoms with a Gaussian envelope at constant detuning. And if you analyze this pulse and choose the parameters correctly, one can achieve a uh, phase difference between the situation where two atoms are Rittberg or two atoms are Rittberg coupled and one atom is Rittberg coupled. Uh, what you want for entanglement is two phi one minus phi two is pi, and that can be achieved uh, with this protocol. And a really detailed analysis, including such small effects as photon recoil, show that for realistic parameters, we should be able to get uh, well above three nine. So it's not being done yet, but there's certainly a path that we can see which should take us to very high fidelity. And um, just to give you a sort of sampling of how the progress has been, we've been working on this in my group for over a decade. Our very first two qubit entanglement was just over the threshold. And uh, we've been making progress since then in fits and starts and steps. Um, progress has, I would say, accelerated in the last couple of years, in part because we're doing more professional engineering uh, on these systems and making them more stable and reliable. And, you know, I think we can get to three nines and beyond. I'm not sure exactly when it's going to happen, but I'd like to hope that happens in the next couple of years here. Um, and then let me just say a couple words about making this compatible with error correction. You know, sort of a basic idea behind quantum error correction is that one wants to extract enough information to tell us where an error occurred, but not so much information that the state collapses and interrupts the computation. And so if you think about a three qubit repetition code by coupling those three qubits onto an ancilla qubit and then measuring its state, one can determine if the uh, quantum state has even or odd parity. And if you uh, use additional qubits, you can actually turn that into enough information to, to correct any single qubit error. One of the challenges is that measuring the ancillas can corrupt the data. We make state measurements by light scattering. If I measure an ancilla qubit by light scattering, I can detect that light with the lens and the camera, but the other atoms also see that scattered light. So one has to protect them from the measurement process on the ancilla. And one way of thinking about that is shelving. So this diagram here is from a paper a few years ago. Uh, this is written here for rubidium, but it shows a sequence of steps that I'll not go into detail on right now, but a sequence of steps that shelve a clock qubit into um, uh, a, a state over here and a state down here that is then measured uh, without affecting the, the shelf states. We've been doing something similar in the lab just recently with cesium and the protocol we've, we've now demonstrated is shown here. We start with our uh, qubit in the clock states and using a microwave pulse, uh, we shelve all the qubits into the three comma zero, three comma one superposition. And then we transfer the three comma zero state over to four comma four on only the qubits we want to measure. And we do that using Stark selected microwave pulses in much the same way that we do Stark selected uh, gate rotations on, on individual uh, qubits. We then do a cycling measurement here using only sigma plus light. So there's no Raman transitions. If the measurement turns out to be a one, there was an atom there, we recool and return that atom back to three zero. And if we, and if we measured a zero, then we just restore three one to four zero and all the qubits. So we've, we've now able to demonstrate these ingredients going into this. Um, here's a, a measurement result showing two atom measurements. The first measurement, this is a thousand shots. The first measurement, which uh, with the histogram projected down onto this axis is our standard 
measurement of atom occupancy with a repumper. So this is done with 2D sigma plus sigma minus molasses. And this could be tweaked up further, but we get about 98.5% retention. We then do a second measurement in a QND uh, modality without a repumper. So this is 1D sigma plus sigma plus light and uh, tuning in closer to resonance and uh, taking a shorter uh, integration time, we get a smaller photon count. These are photoelectrons, about 55 here, about 25 or so here, but we can still make a very well separated measurement and actually has a very similar retention value. So we can make this measurement using sigma plus, sigma plus light. And we've also been able to verify that we can preserve coherence of the spectator qubits after shelving, uh, waiting five milliseconds, and then deshelving. Uh, we have some more work to do to improve this, but we're currently seeing coherence preservation at sort of the 93% the level and with room for improvement. So putting these pieces together, uh, we're now ready to start doing mid-circuit measurements uh, on the system. You know, someone asked about T gates. How do we, how are we going to prepare T gates? Well, these are some of the capabilities that will go into uh, distillation protocols that are needed for T gate preparation. Another approach to the mid circuit measurement um, that we're very interested in, and I think ultimately it's going to be more powerful than this uh, shelving approach, is to use two species, where one type of atom is a computational qubit, say cesium. Another type uh, is used for ancilla, say rubidium, and we'll use interspecies gates for syndrome measurements. So think of a surface code plaquette where these uh, four cesium data qubits are um, mapped onto a rubidium qubit uh, for, for the uh, syndrome extraction. And uh, this measurement qubit need not be a single atom. It could be a, a multi-atom ensemble qubit, which will give us a much larger photon signal and therefore a faster measurement. Uh, there's been real progress of late on uh, demonstrating such two species arrays uh, in Chicago and Wuhan, a beautiful result from Hannes Bernin's group uh, showing large arrays of interleaved uh, cesium and rubidium atoms. We've been working on something similar in my group, and this shows um, simultaneous hyperfine control of individual cesium and rubidium uh, atoms in, in a small version of this kind of setup. There's also a lot of ideas that are being developed just recently, an EIT protection idea from Dave Weiss's group, and uh, very interesting work using euterbium metastable qubits that's up on the archive. Um, so I see I used my entire hour for that first topic. And, uh, you know, maybe I'll just stop here, but say a few words about these next two things. And this two species idea, I think, will be very powerful for error correction. Uh, we see it also as enabling for quantum networking. And we're working on um, architectures and actually building them now where we're going to use rubidium for atom photon entanglement and remote entanglement generation, and then use the interspecies gate to couple those rubidium qubits to cesium qubits for computation, which will be impervious to the light used for the, for the networking. So that, again, this provides isolation where needed. And then working with Shimon, we have a proposal out for using a 3D array of trapped single atoms uh, as a new kind of uh, atomic clock using a, um, I would say, poor man's metastable state that exists in the cesium atom. And because this is an array of cesium atoms, and over here we've started to demonstrate that, yes, we can entangle multiple cesium atoms together, I think this will be a very interesting test bed for looking at the performance of entangled atomic clocks. And I think what I'll do then is maybe just zip over and go to my summary slide to acknowledge my group and um, thank you for your attention this afternoon. Thanks, Mark, for a really great talk. It's, uh, there's lots of questions. Um, so Bill Phillips has a, a couple. So one is following up on his, his, his first question about GHC states. So to clarify my question, if you take the reduction in contrast of the parity oscillations as an indicator of the contrast of the Ramsey fringes, uh, is that decrease in contrast bigger or smaller than what you would be required to do better with your, uh, you know, uh, than root n with your entangled states? Very good question. So um, that's a reasonable question, and it makes me wish that I we had checked and I could answer it, but we haven't made that check. Bill, I, I will say that my 
expectation is we're below where we need to be to, to see an improvement today. Um, and then uh, another question from Bill. So you mentioned you want cold atoms for better fidelity. Say you loaded from a BC and changed nothing else, what fidelity would you get? So the zero temperature fidelity limit that we expect given our current imp implementation, if I approximate a BC is a zero temperature for these experiments, um, I, I'm quite sure it is, is well above two nines. I couldn't say exactly where without looking back at my notes, but it's certainly above two nines. Um, and then there's another question um, from David Spearings. Uh, can you comment on the overhead involved in creating full connectivity in regions of 10 to 20 sites? For example, compensating for blockade shifts as a function of distance, frequency shifts introduced by the acoustic deflectors, et cetera. Sure, I think the overhead's actually quite low. So the fact that depending on the separation, the physical separation of the atom pair you wish to perform a gate on, the optimal gate parameters will be different, but that's something you pre, you can pre-compute and pre-calibrate and put in the control system logic. Um, as far as the frequency shifts go, I, I didn't pause to explain this, but uh, as you know, when you spatially uh, deflect a beam or scan a beam using an acoustic device, there's a concomitant uh, frequency shift. And you might think, well, that's gonna be a problem because I won't be resonant with the Rydberg state, but we're using a two photon excitation and we set up the deflector so that the positive frequency shift of say the first photon is countered by the negative frequency shift of the second photon. And so we can do that um, on rows and uh, columns uh, as desired without getting additional undesired uh, illumination at other sites. And so uh, with the acoustic, we can't get full 2D connectivity but we can get connectivity on, on rows and columns uh, today. Great, okay. Well, I think maybe that's uh, a good place to, to stop. So uh, I'll thank you, Mark, once again, for a really fantastic uh, and, and exciting talk. Um, and then I'll quickly advertise our talk in two weeks, which will be the last of uh, this sort of spring term of Vamos. And then we're gonna be taking a summer break um, but so the last talk before DAMOP as well is from Michael Zurch um, of UC Berkeley, who will be telling us about nonlinear extreme ultraviolet spectroscopy, a novel probe for surfaces and symmetry breaking with elemental resolution. Uh, and that's in two weeks on May 27th. Uh, and then the only other thing I'll say is you can join, if you're interested, um, and I encourage you to do so, you can join Mark for uh, a post-seminar discussion at the link that I'm posting in the chat uh, both on YouTube and on Zoom now. Uh, that'll be hosted by a couple of my grad students. Um, so uh, thanks again, Mark. And yeah, you, you can click over whenever, um, but really appreciate your, your talk. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Mark. Thanks.